Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Take a moment to remember those three firefighters and nine police officers that have died since our last board meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming this afternoon, uh, calling our meeting to order, our flag salute, uh, regular business meeting. Uh, do we have any uh, public comments for the public forum at this point? I have not received any requests to address the board. Okay, and there are no executive staff responses to those comments then. Consent agenda. Uh, we have four items there. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I will move to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Then consent agenda has been approved. Next up on the agenda is the financial report and updates from our finance director, Gabe Boldra. Okay. <laughs> a little faster today. And well, Gabe said that we're going to set up. So we received an email from the county, Yavapai County, that they've changed over their system. And they are supposed to have our, our financials to us by the 10th of the month every, every month. And uh, we did not get them as of even yet. No, we're still still not. So we still not received them. So Gabe will be doing a, an abbreviated uh, financial report, but we have no is supposed to have it to us by the 10th, but I guess it's not. Uh, Maricopa County's also done a change over their system and they got the same problems down there right now. Is so this uh, Yavapai or, or Coconino? Yavapai. 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 Yeah, all of our finance goes through Yavapai County. Okay. So this game is working on getting this done. I just want to give you a heads up that, yeah, unfortunately, um, I would say uh, the, the software transition for Yavapai will be quick for us, uh, but we're now in the sixth month of the conversion in Maricopa County. And uh, we're still usually about 45 days late on the reports from the county. So it's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to deal with it as it comes. I mean, essentially, um, from, from our standpoint, the majority of the transactions are, actually all the transactions are already recorded. So um, if this ever comes up here, you'll see from the financial report that from an expense standpoint, everything's been captured. From a revenue standpoint, everything has been captured with the exception of our tax revenue. Um, that's the one piece that without the reports from the county, we, we don't know what that number is. Are the so. dollars flowing in and the paperwork's just not done? Or yeah, are we well, yes. I mean, it's hard to tell. We're getting the <laughs> money, but you can't it's not like we have it. an It's not like we have an online access. Um, it's not like we have online access to the county to be able to see that there are dollars flowing in. Um, for the most part, um, they, it's usually, the money is typically flowing in with the counties. It's just a matter of them allocating it to the appropriate funds. And then on top of that, then getting the reports out. So, well, then, uh, Gabe, for what you need for tonight's presentation, do you want to move it further down on the agenda and, and allow you more time? Oh gosh, no, I'm I'm ready. I'm, I'm okay. If you're ready, ahead. let's roll. Just wondering if you guys are ready. <laughs> All right. So um, as I kind of said, um, you'll see for the month of September, I don't have anything recorded for property tax revenue. Um, we were anticipating eight hundred five thousand. Um, we have more than adequate funds in our county warrant account to uh, cover any of our warrants and everything. Obviously, if we got to the point where that was starting to look low, um, then we'd be in, in more contact with the county. But from a financial standpoint, we're in, we're in good shape. Um, Non-levy revenue, we uh, saw 192687 um, for the month of September. Um, we did actually see um, a little bit of drop in ambulance revenue for the month. Um, we only received 135000 in ambulance revenue, and a lot of that is just due to seasonality of the timing and everything. As we start getting into the cold and flu season, we'll see that kind of um, come back up. On the expense side, uh, total expenses were, uh, for personnel were uh, 911748 We were under budget by 97000 um, due to uh, just some kind of, some, some various timing on some of the expenses. 
We have, however, been full trending over on, on overtime costs. We're actually over budget by 17000 on overtime for the month, um, which is kind of attributing to when we get to the year to date, us being over on personnel for the year. Um, we are kind of working with the chief and looking at some different options on that. Really, we're running into just a lot of people being out for various reasons, injuries, illness, um, vacations. And so that's impacting our overtime budget right now for the first part of the year. Um, G the Gabe, if I can, if I can interject, yeah. is that part of that uh, considered some reimbursable uh, revenue from federal government as a result of sending people out? We track that differently on a different fund in our system. So no, this is related. All of this is just re directly related to the operations. Okay. So, um, on other expenses, vehicles and equipment, um, it's trending under budget, uh, 18288 for the month. Um, utilities and communications was pretty much right in line with budget there at uh, 16784 uh, Managerial costs under budget uh, by 82000 at 30368 And then we actually, um, a debt service payment that we had budgeted to pay in the month of October, we actually paid in the month of September, so that's why we see that variance there in um, our uh, capital and contingency was actually a debt service payment. Uh, year to date, you see our total revenue, um, 838989 Obviously, there is 800000 of budgeted property tax revenue that is not reflected in that total revenue number. Um, in addition, our non-levy revenues, our ambulance has actually been really strong at the end of the year. Um, even with the, the under budget last month, we're actually still ahead by 38000 on ambulance revenue. So um, our total revenues are up, um, and I don't anticipate any issues with collection um, from the county. So once we get that report, we'll be able to verify that. Um, on the expense side, you'll see our total expenses year to date are $4,164,000. It puts us under budget on total expenses by 44000 um, personnel is over, as I mentioned, um, 3500000 on personnel expenses. Of that $100,000, um, roughly 21000 of that is uh, related to overtime. And then uh, the other 80000 79000 is related to um, timing on some sick and vacation buybacks. Um, vehicles and equipment, uh, we're still trending under budget on that, $142,869. Um, understand that some of it is we are actually under on, on our maintenance ex expenses, but also a lot of that is a lot of people are, are prone to waiting towards later in the year to work on some of their projects because, you know, in the past, districts are used to not having a lot of revenue or cash on hand in the first part of the fiscal year. So that's kind of a, um, that's a little bit of the result of why we're seeing this variance under um, because of that pattern of behavior that's been built. Um, as we continue to work on our fund balance and, and things like that, we'll start to get people to, you know, balance out their, their projects and not try to do everything in, you know, uh, April, May, and June of, of the fiscal year. Uh, utilities and communications, you see slightly uh, under budget at 49487 uh, Managerial is under budget as well for the month by uh, 250, 257457 and uh, finally, on our capital um, and contingency expenditure, um, that's just reflective of debt service, and we're at two hundred eleven thousand seven hundred fifty-six dollars. And again, that's showing over budget because of that timing um, of that payment in uh, this month of September. Percentage um, of budget uh, currently, we're at uh, we've expended twenty-six percent of our budget, uh, with seventy-five percent, seventy-four percent remaining um, for the next uh, ten months of the year. Um, percentage of expenses year to date, uh, personnel 84%, uh, operations six and managerial and our capital expenditures um, equal at 5% of our total expenses. Uh, that cash position, as I kind of mentioned, we're not in, in any point of concern. Um, we total cash on hand at the end of September was uh, 3067000 without the reconciled county revenues as well. Um, compared to last year at the same time, which was 2.6 million um, cash on hand. You'll see our other assets decrease from 1.1 1, uh, 1 .1 million to 765,000. A lot of that's due to um, receivables on wildland. Um, last year, we're still seeing high receivables this year, although we're still kind of getting into receivables again with wildland, it's not as bad as it's been in the past. And then um, just a slight increase in our current liabilities, uh, 269,000. Um, at the end of the month of September compared to 204,000 um, at the same time last year. And unless there's any other questions, uh, that concludes uh, the finance report for September.
I do have a question. Uh, as a result of the delay in the financials from Yavapai County, would it be advisable to table approval of this past month's financial reports until we get those, or should we, or would you advise we approve them? So what we've done in, in uh, Maricopa County is I've had just the boards just approve the financial report, um, and then any if there's any changes, and in this case, um, the only change will be the recording of the revenue. I'll notify the board of that just via email. Um, and then we'll update our financial report to include that revenue. Okay, then with that said, uh, would anybody like to entertain a motion to approve the financials for September? Sure, I, I move to approve the financial report of September 2018. Do I have a second? Second. Second, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the financial reports for September have been approved. Next item on the agenda is our staff items. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, discussion, possible action, review, and approval of the financial policies manual. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, we brought before you last month a complete financial uh, set of policies. Um, as a board, um, that's one of your roles is to uh, make policy. <laughs> so. Uh, we took not only you know our experience um, around the state and, and in the accounting world, um, we took input from uh, staff, chief, program managers, administrative services manager, and um, developed that complete set for Sedona Fire. Um, there is one as we're going through for final check, there was one uh, typo we recognized on page 23 on purchasing of the purchase orders um, because we, we we obviously don't reinvent the financial policies for every single client. We have a template that we use. Um, we had 50,000 in there as um, a purchasing threshold, and that should actually read 5,000. So um, that obviously is not in what you have in your board packet. Um, so if you do choose to approve it tonight, I would add the language with the uh, correction um, of the purchasing authority or the purchase order uh, threshold uh, from 50,000 to 5,000. Um, but on that note, that would be obviously something we'd like to discuss further down the road is bringing the purchasing authorities more in line with industry, or I should say districts of uh, the size of Sedona. But again, that's kind of for, for a later time. But at, at now, at this point, unless there's questions, um, specifically the financial policies, mm -hmm. um, I ask the board to consider approval. Uh, in terms of uh, down the road looking at uh, a larger uh, threshold for the purchasing order. What uh, I know you've told us before, but if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us again, what is more typical? Um, let me, so I'm not speaking off the top of my head. This is for that of the chief, correct? Cor well, yes. Yeah. In general. For the board not to be involved. So um, looking across kind of uh -huh. varying districts, um, all of, of various sizes, um, the largest of, of the districts being at um, 44 million in revenue, um, the smallest of the districts being at 6 million in revenue, um, and the, even the city of uh, Sedona at 26 million um, annual budget. Um, the, I would say the average mm -hmm. is, is around 50,000. I think that's probably too high given, given the history and, and the um, the, in, the environment here, mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely recommend considering a threshold of like 25,000 mm -hmm. um, for obviously budgeted expenditures. It doesn't allow the chief or, or as we move up the scale for other program managers, it doesn't allow that authority to spend money that's not budgeted. Um, from, from the standpoint of the board has to approve dollars um, for, the, for the budget purposes any money that wants to be spent outside of what's budgeted has to come to the board for approval, mm -hmm. regardless of the, of the dollar amount. Um, so that would kind of be where, where I'd like to start the discussion mm -hmm. with the board. But um, yeah, you look at, you know, Northwest Fire, for example, is at 50,000 uh, spending authority, uh, Green Valley, 65,000, Pine Tops, 50,000. Um, city of Sedona, the, uh, the city manager, who's kind of the equivalent of, of the fire chief, um, their, their spending authority is 100,000. Um, but again, I think with the culture and the environment and the history, I think being closer to that 25,000 threshold is, is, is more appropriate um, for, for a starting point. And what is it now yeah. currently? Uh, 5,000. 5,000. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Gabe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so on that note, as we're 
evaluating with the change in our finance. You know, some of the, the holdup here is really just we're trying to figure out how this whole thing's going to wind up with, with the finance and, and with uh, Pam having left. And so mm -hmm. yeah. just keeping it status quo for now, figure out what that's going to look like as we go forward and, and kind of rounding out this, this process. And then we'll be back to you with, hey, here's what we have to do for finance, whether we're going to engage with JVG on a permanent basis, have some sort of clerical staff mm -hmm. end up here, and the spending authority piece is all just kind of tied up in there. And, and we wrangle with it a little bit and just said, keep it where it's at. Right now, there's too many other things happening. And we'll evaluate it. Excellent. When we finish up, so this perhaps piece. in a few months. Yeah, a month or two, uh -huh. probably. I mean, I, I think we're probably a month or two away from yeah. ma making a final decision. So whenever Gabe and us, we kind of let the dust settle. And right now, operationally, we're a lot of stuff kind of happening. Mm -hmm. See what's normal and what's just transition work for, for JVG and how that's going to pencil out, and then what makes sense if it's a outsource or if it's a employee based uh, for some of the clerical pieces that are happening. Good. Any other comments? So, so actually, tonight we're not really looking for an approval of this document, or are we? No. Okay. And if an approval is to be granted, it's with the exceptions of the corrections on page 23, as you described. And would it also include the the increase in the fire chief's authority, or that's a separate item altogether? No. That's a separate. No. Okay. No, the, the, the policies that are before you. Um, have the chief's authority currently at the 5,000. Everybody's right. authority is where it's currently been in practice. Right. So there's no recommended change at this time. The only recommendation at this point was, would be to adopt the um, financial policies as written. Okay. That one correction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, with that said, then I'll go ahead and make the motion to uh, approve the financial policies procedures manual uh, with the corrections of those items described on page 23, item 9, uh, as they're written. Uh, that's the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. And I, I'll just add to that that, that what we're uh, changing is to reduce the 50,000 that's stated to 5,000 on uh, item number 9. Right, which is that change. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the second was by Abe. Uh, any further discussion on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nope. The financial procedures manual is approved. <clears throat> Thank you for all your work on that, uh, Chief, also with your staff. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the fire chief's uh, portion, which is all the monthly fire report. All right, board, thank you. Your fire chief's report is in your packet. Uh, you can see we're trending about uh, Looks like about 70 calls more for the year so far. Uh, so we're you know, 10 months or nine months through the, the year. So we may end up at about 100 calls more this year, which would be on track for about 4,500 calls. Uh, pretty much uh, no huge. I mean, 266 ambulance calls for the for the uh, uh, for the month is the second highest this year so far. So it's a busy month for ambulance calls, and you can see the breakdown there of. Backcountry rescues at 107 year to date versus 83. So we're certainly keeping busy out there, but trending. I mean, there's no spike there. It's been trending all year long, a little bit busier than normal. Um, fire calls are up a little bit uh, year to date, and the rest is pretty much just uh, chugging along. So uh, with that, um, you know, the average response time we talk about it's 718 for the year, uh, 708 for the month. And then our 90th percentile reaching 12 minutes and 10 seconds for the 90th percentile. So um, it's where we are. And uh, any questions about the response? Looking at the response by stations is pretty straightforward and the, the standard distribution there. Calls per time of day is, again, standard uh, throughout the year here is looking like normal. Community risk. John, you want to talk about community risk at all and anything in your division as it relates to the report or uh, updated? Uh, nothing necessarily that re relates to the report. I did have a meeting with the county uh, last week. I don't know, oh, Yavapai County, to clarify. I don't know if this has anything to do with the uh, financial software, but they, their planning and building department is enacting a software called Citizen Serve, uh, which kind of meshes with my desire to be performing more. Uh, paperless plan reviews. Uh, so there's going to be a, an electronic uh, 
link between us and the county. Uh, this stuff will be happening uh, electronically. It makes, uh, makes it a lot easier for them and the citizens to see our comments. It makes it very easy for us to go in and see what they've called out on their plans, where these, uh, where these permits are in the entire process. So that's probably going to happen uh, after the first of the year. They're enacting it November 1st, but after the first of the year, they're going to provide training to us. Uh, at Sedona Fire uh, to get up to speed and start using that system. We're pretty excited about it. I think it's going to be a positive thing. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, company inspections, they have been out in the field doing those inspections. I had a conversation with Captain Wassel today, and we're having a meeting next week when uh, his shift is back on duty. They have come up with lots of... Uh, lots of uh, items that they want to, to discuss. Not so much in the performance of the, the company inspections, but the scheduling part of it. So I think we're going to have some changes to make and go through the next iteration and see where that leads us. So that's where that's, where that's at. Excellent. Um, the, uh, the grant update, you see we re received a $1,400 uh, grant update for, or a grant from Kairos as it relates to our health screening. So one of the items on my agenda here is to talk about the health screening. Yesterday we, we hosted the, uh, a skin screening for skin cancer. You see a bunch of us with little dots on our heads. It's uh, non-cancerous. You should probably take care of that type of thing. Uh, Heidi was not. She's running around telling us how she doesn't have any spots on it, her, but the rest it, of us that do have spots. She doesn't go outside. <laughs> so, uh, and then we had uh, mammograms, and we had uh, some bone density testing going on for folks as well. This was in conjunction with the city of Sedona, the school district, as well. It was open to the public, and I don't know if we had any public folks at all come. We had a couple of public folks come. So again, just uh, as breast cancer awareness is and the, the pink shirts that you'll see us all running around in on the on Mondays for staff and on the first day of each tour, the, the firefighting folks have their, their pink shirts on. So um, try to, trying to raise that awareness and, and certainly, uh, you know, we've all got folks that have been affected by, by skin cancer and, and breast cancer and, and any, uh, lots of different cancers. But um, so certainly important to, to remember that. Take care of yourself, wear sunscreen and be like Heidi. <coughs> what would Heidi do, I guess? Um, on the training note, just a couple things of, uh, of comment there. We, we're always got stuff happening uh, with the training, but we had some folks go down to fire school uh, last month. So every year it was a 45th annual fire school. Mike Duran, our training officer, is uh, heavily involved in the statewide training committee. I don't know if he was a safety officer again this year or not. I think that last year, again this year, he was a safety officer for that whole event. It's a, it's a pretty big, they had 800 and some students, I believe, or something down there from all over the state, as well as actually a couple different uh, uh, other states, and I think even the country, I don't know, like, uh, Mexico and Canada, or uh, Mexico, I forget, but there's a couple, someone from a different country or two there as well. Um, so, so good job by, by Mike, and we had uh, six or seven folks go down there. I taught a class uh, or a couple hours down there one day, and, uh, and a couple other things going on down there. So it was a good, good time for us to be part of, and, and it's a great, great class, a uh, great uh, conference. Um, Rick Evans and John Davis had the luxury of spending time out at the airport teaching some folks at the airport uh, staff uh, how to use a fire extinguisher, so it went well <laughs> out there, I guess. Uh, probably important to just drop a note. John did uh, join the airport uh, authority board and s served mm -hmm. proudly in that capacity uh, up there. So thank you for getting engaged with airplanes and all the cool kids. Associates and bachelor's and uh, degrees and such are in, in process. So I think Ed's actually in process in his master's degree, taking a class or two. Is that correct? It's going well, having fun? I, I am engaged in classes and doing well for relatives. <laughs> <laughs> um, <What's> so <laughs> so uh, it's always fun when you want to join school until you actually get the homework and stuff. But anyway. yeah. Well, I, I, since you brought up what, what is the, uh, the, the major, what is the category? with what you do, right? So, and then in your packet board, there's a thank you from one of our firefighters, Donnie Minardi, who just says thanks. We sent him to a, a GIS class. Um, 
as part of our succession planning and our interest. Uh, uh, Tammy Sherman's been with us for, for quite some time at the fire district, uh, running all kinds, you know, from dispatch into GIS and, and, and a couple other things probably in between. Um, her long-term plans are, are probably to enjoy retirement someday. And so we've been working to uh, get one of our firefighters uh, up to speed and uh, uh, learning the GIS system. So he's coming in on his off days and, and trying to learn some of those systems and how we update and keep our mapping program and everything going. And so he, he attended a class and just said thank you to, to the board in this case uh, for, for letting him uh, uh, go to this class and, and continue to, to get this great training. So on my list here is open house you had the chance to make some pancakes i think <laughs> dave and gene were the ones to belly up to the pancake uh, table and well from the board here and then we had certainly had mr demery here as well uh join us and so it was great to, to see some engaged folks uh we had some bad weather it was kind of cold and a little bit of rainy in the afternoon uh you know so uh we had hot dogs at station three and we had we actually had a pretty good turnout at three actually but better than here um so it was, it was good. It was fire prevention week. So we uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty typical time for people to do open houses. And uh, we'll, we'll get some notes internally as to what went well, what didn't go well. Um, I will say that firefighter Joe, our inflatable firefighter by uh, one of Kerry Tarver's sons, uh, had a really good time. Like he was practicing for Halloween or something almost. Uh, he, he did really well. So we thank uh, uh, Reese uh, Tarver for, for helping out with that. And uh, just nice to see all of our, our uh, team get together and, and put on a, a great presentation for our community. Certainly the fire extinguisher demonstration we did. Uh, we talked to some folks about the ladder truck. Uh, it rained at three and there's some lightning in the area or potential lightning, so we did not put the stick up at mm -hmm. uh, three just due to safety reasons. But mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, all, all, was, all was good and well and lots of, lots of positive feedback and, and chance to walk a lot of people through the fire stations and see some of the challenges that we have in our uh, current locations, uh, Station 1 and Station 3 specifically. And uh, so, so that was uh, uh, afternoon and morning well spent. Uh, any comments or questions from either of you two? Gene? No, it was an excellent turnout, Station 3. Uh, the neighbors came out and so on. And matter of fact, it, uh, several of them uh, circled around the, um, uh, I, be I believe, correct me if I'm mistaken, FEMA um, equipped vehicle uh, that is here in Sedona uh, that we can use but is subject to being called on a national emergency. That's correct. Our Station 3 has a we call a heavy rescue squad. That was uh, actually one of our fire engines uh, back in the day that we refurbished through a FEMA grant after 2000 uh, or 9-11. Uh, um, uh, they have placed nine what they call um, RTUs, re rescue, uh, RTUs, I forget, re regional response uh, trucks, I thought, RRT, no, it's a regional response trucks. Uh, there's nine of them in the state of Arizona, and so there's a, kind of a caveat that we have that, the tools, equipment, and all the things that are on it, that if there is an incident within the state or technically elsewhere, they, they, they have the kind of the first dibs to, to call that up, and, and that is and was purchased uh, on a grant. Uh, as best I know, Ed, do you know if all of that was on a grant or just the truck itself? I, I believe the, the, the truck and associated equipment all the, all the equipment from the smallest of all drill to the, the biggest jackhammer and whatever the Department of Homeland Defense. Okay, yeah, so all that was, again, through a grant and, you know, back, I don't know how long ago, that was 2008 maybe or something we got that? I, I forget. Eight or nine, Keller, Chief Keller was the uh, lead that <coughs> had a jackhammer down. Yeah. So, so that, that was a big mistake. Well, the people were, I think, interested in the fact that uh, Sedona Fire and and other fire organizations around the country and what have you is a, a vital and critical element of, of the critical incident defense of this country, and uh, the county, the state, and then beyond. And that's why FEMA has provided this equipment. Absolutely. And that's why I didn't comment, because uh -huh. I, I can't compete with that. Mr. No, Dever, I, I, actually, actually, it was uh, what I enjoyed most about it, even though the numbers may have been down here at Fire Station 1, is that it, it afforded us the opportunity to speak to some of the, the folks here uh, a little bit more in depth, uh, rather than a mass crowd that you get, you didn't have a chance to. Yeah. So uh, that was good. Uh, I had a good chance to talk to a lot of people. That was good, Mr. Demery. Any comments? Pancakes were good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were delicious. There's our chef right there, Chef uh, <laughs> Chef Davis. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and then I, I guess the only other thing that I'll share with you uh, as it relates to the Chief's report and current events. Um, is the uh, uh, 
the fact that uh, you know the auto pulse demonstration we gave you last month, uh, we've used it a couple times already. Uh, but yesterday we had a chance to use it uh, on our first witness cardiac arrest where we had bystander CPR get done. And uh, down the street, just, just down the street here, our folks were able to get uh, our, our patient on the, uh, on the auto pulse and, and, and get going and, and take all the way to the, to the cath lab. Uh, so the safety that Ed spoke to and, and all those things uh, went beautifully. We were able to actually get the patient uh, to begin perfusing and breathing on their own and, and uh, and right into the cath lab and, and surgery and, and things are looking very positive for our, our uh, person yesterday. So we, we put a press release out this morning on that and I just really think it's important to, to realize and last month we talked with the survivor from right. a couple months before. Ironically at open house we, we, we met with someone that we you know had a significant cardiac event uh, back in, in Mother's Day of, uh, it would be 17 I guess technically but as a first chance to, to come back and say thank you to the, the fire district, but also one of the firefighters or the paramedic that was on the call. Um, and uh, you know, so talking to him and his wife about you know, his experience and, and what happened and, and that he's now happy and healthy and, and here to, to, to tell a story uh, that was imminent uh, if uh, not taken care of uh, in the way that we did and, 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 the, and the cardiac uh, cath lab and things that, that saved his life as well. So it's a, it's a team effort. We certainly play a pivotal role in all of that. And uh, that, that door to balloon time is what we call it is so critical. And, and so just interesting to have last month, Saturday, have this person talk to us. And then yesterday we have, mm. you know, uh, I think we used the auto pulse again today. Uh, we had it on standby. Didn't standby. Didn't, didn't need to use it today. Or it didn't, yeah. So we had another mm -hmm. uh, cardiac uh, incident that, that it was not needed on. Uh, but uh, so it's, uh, it's, getting, it's, getting, it's getting a workout. So. Um, so proud of our folks for, for stepping up and Ralph was, uh, Captain Kurtz was on that call yesterday. So that uh, is my chief's report, unless you have any other questions. No, I didn't, I, unless there's any other questions by the board. Um, I, I would like to take this moment just to uh, apologize for not introducing our guest this evening, oh. Uh, oh, yeah. Mr. Gene Neal, uh, in place of Bill uh, as, our, as our legal counsel. So welcome, welcome. I don't think Gene's a stranger to Sedona. I believe he was a, a city uh, attorney for the city of Sedona at one point. Uh, so mm -hmm. he found the place okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay. All righty. Um, next item up on the agenda is discussion possible action for the application for assistance to firefighters grant through FEMA for portable radios. So as uh, Board Member McCar uh, McCarthy mentioned, uh, the importance of FEMA. Um, Federal Emergency Management Agency. They underwrite or, or um, they're the, the purveyor of, of uh, assistance to firefighter grant with AFG. Uh, been going on again since I think probably 2011 or twice I've done that, 9-11. Um, uh, they, they really ramped up our grants and things like that. Um, and so, so while they're still difficult to get and every couple of years they're, it's on the, on the bubble whether it's gonna be funded or not, we continue at this point to remain funded at, at a federal level. Um, part of our board uh, requirements is uh, to request uh, l these large grants like this that we get approval before we submit uh, for the grant. And that grant is due, I think, on the 27th or 28th, something like that, 26, maybe 26th um, of uh, this month. So we, when they open it up, they don't tell you when it's opening and they say you got 30 days or, or so and then they close it and you got to get your stuff in and be ready to go. We are submitting a request for radios. Our radios are about 10 years old and there's different criteria in the grant. So there's high level and uh, medium and, and low priorities. So the radios uh, meet a high priority. We believe um, the, the total amount is about $350,000 to replace our radios. And so if we have an opportunity to, to have that happen through a, a grant that would be uh, spectacular. It would be an opportunity to free up space in our capital uh, improvement plan for other capital projects. And uh, there is a match on that, 10 or 15%. Um, we're looking at uh, asking you for 15% uh, as a chance to even enhance our ability to get the grant as those sometimes get you a few more points in the, in the grading scale. Um, uh, so with that, um, I don't think I need to go through the details of all the different nuances of the radios and how they work and such at this point. We're just asking if we can submit the grant. If, if approved, they're still giving away grants right now from last year. And last year we wrote for a fire engine, 
uh, a type three and mobile radios, I think, ones that go inside the fire trucks, if I'm not mistaken, is what we wrote last year. We did not succeed. Uh, but Jerome, they got an uh, air pack grant, a SCBA grant, and an engine this year. I think Copper Canyon got something this year, too, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. I think I heard they got something. So a bunch of our neighbors did, did get some grants, and, and so we weren't, you know, we've had it been successful in the past. It's, it is what it is. So I just ask that you approve the ability for staff to go forward and submit this grant by the timeline. Okay. Do I have anybody who would like to make a motion? I move to approve authorization for SFD staff to submit the request for portable radios through the assistance to firefighter grant, in parentheses, AFG, process as necessary. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The uh, motion to approve right in the grant is approved. Thank you. <coughs> Board, we'll keep you posted and we'll, we'll budget accordingly if uh, need be. Okay. Next year. Okay. The next item on the <laughs> agenda is discussion of possible action on the purchase order of 1770 to officer survival solutions in the amount of $10,460 for rescue task force ballistic gear. So, so board, if you're uh, obviously aware, uh, you know, the prevalence of, of uh, hostile environments, active shooter situations is sadly continuing to, to uh, be in our ever, each and every community that we, we watch on TV and those are somebody's community. Uh, currently, we do not have any ballistic uh, protection, BPE it's called, ballistic protective equipment. And uh, uh, we've been researching Ca uh, Captain Baker, or Battalion Chief uh, Baker as he is today, uh, has been working pretty hard with, with Captain Lewis and a few other uh, folks within the organization to, to start working on our policy. There's some uh, works uh, in, in place to have a, a countywide policy between the, the fire and the police and I'll, everyone be working together. That's really critical for all of us. Um, and so that's all kind of happening in, in, the, in the back side of this whole thing. But uh, at the end of the day, we know we need to get equipment uh, to protect our folks. Um, and, uh, and so in the middle of all this, the National Fire Protection Association recently just released NFPA 3000, which is uh, the standard for which fire departments should be prepared, trained, and, and, and to the level of which uh, they should uh, be outfitted. And, uh, and so we are recommending that we start with 10 sets of ballistic gear, that's two for each station, and uh, that allows our, our folks, regardless of where the incident is, that we'll have some folks having accessible ballistic uh, protective equipment. Uh, we are not, at this point, talking about the policy so much, but I want to let you know, as an organization, we are not looking to put ourselves in hostile env environments where there's an active shooter and an uncontrolled situation, what we would consider to be the hot zone. We would be in situations where we, we may get into the warm zone with the escort of police yeah, protection awesome. in what's called the rescue task force model. And, uh, and that is uh, doing the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, I can tell you that each and every person in the organization has different comfort levels as it relates to mm -hmm. guns and shootings and you know, or, you know, that type of environment. Um, we want to make sure everyone's trained and comfortable and able to, to respond in a situation like that, know what to do. And uh, we know that the quicker we get in and get people out and get them to definitive care, the, the more likely they are to, to survive. And we've seen that in many of those cases where they did not act and they, the lo loss of life was considerably greater than uh, had people acted. And so while it's one of those things in my personal, I remember telling myself back in 19 aught something, whatever, that I would never, if I got to put on a bulletproof vest, I'm quitting this job. Um, that's, that's the way I felt. And in today's environment, I completely have changed my opinion and believe that it's, it's mandatory, necessary, and uh, something that we <coughs> need to do to protect our folks. We give them fire gear so they can go into a fire, which is a hostile, a different hostile environment. We have to give them the, the safety equipment to go into those environments. This is uh, uh, at the recommendation of the committee of the type of gear. There's different types and different styles. It says a 10-year lifespan instead of a five-year lifespan. Uh, so doubles our, our life expectancy of the equipment, and it's uh, a little bit less delicate than some of the other uh, types. Um, and this is a, a kind of a down and dirty type, get in, get out, and you know, not a, we're wearing it every day like the police do on, on the, you know, 
it's it's a different different setup, so sizing and things are going to be a little bit less particular. I have a question, Chief. Um, are these um, ballistic vests one size fits all? Um, and um, the ballistic v vests that I'm familiar with have plate pockets that plates are, um, and so the vests. You know, there's a couple of very large people on this department, so. Oh, they're, they're, oh, it's all muscle, sir. It's all muscle. Uh, so this is a, a battalion chief Baker. Oh, here's who's one of them right here. Doing the hard work. So to, to answer your question, yes, these specific uh, styles that we, we spec'd out are a level four, according to the National Institute of Justice, which rates those ballistic protection for uh, the BPE. So a level four is being the highest that we can get. It protects up to a 7.62 millimeter caliber, which is equivalent to a 308 uh, armor piercing cal uh, caliber. Uh, the specific design we got models turnouts. Uh, it's a brown khaki color like our turnouts with a reflective striping that says fire on it. So we're not mistaken for police officers. Uh, we'd be the rescue task force as uh, Chief Kazian mentioned. Um, the gear itself has adjustable straps. Uh, they do extend in length for torso, and they fit individuals up to 300 pounds. So they, that's one consideration we took when we were looking at these vests, uh, the equipment, and trying to outfit the entire department versus having two per station being adjustable uh, regard, or, you know, regardless of what an individual is on duty that day. So they have the adjustable straps for the torso length. They've also got an integrated two-inch uh, sewn-in, stitched-in rescue strap on the back should one of the rescuers need drag. rescuing. It's a quick drag strap you can grab and, and pull the individual out. So does that answer your question? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, the uh, 10 total is what we're looking at? At this time, we're, we're working with 10, and we're going to evaluate what the needs are beyond that or not. Uh, I, I think we need to get in there. There may be a need for more. That may be plenty. What we the crews will not be going, it'll be two people in a crew, in a rescue task force with the police officers. Right. You really aren't gonna realistically be going in with more than that. You, you certainly could, but you'll be two and two and two, kind of like the Noah's Ark thing, two by two. So uh, so the, the, the classes and the training that we've gone to is with multiple agencies from Tucson, Phoenix Fire, larger city departments that are adopting the same model and modeling the, the NFPA standard, NFPA 3000, which was recently released. So as Chief Casey mentioned, the rescue task force model is two rescuers, i.e. firefighter paramedics, with an escort of two to three police officers. Now there's a coordinated training and movements that uh, you conduct as you're entering these warm zones where the, the threat has either been isolated or eliminated to the best of law enforcement's knowledge to get in there and access these patients to stop the bleed and get them out to definitive care uh, more rapidly. So we've been training with them, and that's the model is, is the two rescuer uh, with the two to three uh, escorts from the, the law enforcement side. So at most, we'd be sending in two individuals per team. Um, now, if we're able to, through a regional response, because other agencies in the Verde Valley are adopting the same model, some have already purchased this ballistic gear, and some have already training frequently with their law enforcement partners, i.e. the city of Cottonwood, um, you know, th there's a chance we get more teams in place if need be, if a large scale event happens from Cottonwood, Copper Canyon and Verde Valley are also looking at, at you know, modeling the same um, standard or, or modeling, you know, their, their response to the NFPA 3000. Well, I applaud the chief and you uh, for um, uh, getting ahead of the curve. Unlike this uh, Long Beach City fire, when have you, they, they suffered the, the death of one of their fire captains um, just it came out of the blue, and that you know the training is everything on on uh, making entry and so on, and and how to uh, medically manage people that are down and then get yourself out. Yes, sir. Can I ask why tan? When we I did I didn't know it was tan. I thought it was red because I saw the picture in here. I thought, oh, that's that's excellent. You can tell exactly who those people are. Tan to me great. seems like military, so. Well, great question, and that was brought up in the RTF class. Uh, Captain Lewis and myself went over to Prescott and took a two-day course. Uh, it's put on by the IC Save organization. It's a nonprofit organization that we're actually uh, attempting to coordinate a training here in early January for our agency and our regional partners, including law enforcement. One of the things they brought up was the red color or a bright yellow color. Unfortunately, it almost makes you a target. 
uh, standing out above everybody else. Um, we wanted to separate ourselves from the police because that also, in a, unfortunately, going into this, and it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about. It's uncomfortable that we're even up here discussing this, as Chief Kazian said, that we're in this climate that we're in. But it's the sad truth, it's the reality. So a lot of these active shooters will target police officers when they see them because the police officers are there to interject and stop the act. So they will target them. They'll also target them if they have a high-vis yellow or a red on. And we looked at that, we asked some of the instructors over there, and they said that exact thing. You almost make yourself stand out too much and become a target. Most of the time, knock on wood, when people see firefighters, we're there to help. We're not a threat. Um, they don't see us as an immediate threat to stop whatever act they're doing if, if we do find ourselves in a, in a hot zone. Um, so they recommended that TAN to really um, make us stand out as firefighters. It's the same matching color as our turnouts exactly with the reflective striping that says fire on it. Okay. No, so, I, and I agree. Excellent it's, question. I agree it's uncomfortable to talk about. I've got two kids in that high school, in that high school so exactly. who are going through active shooter drills, which I never thought would happen and it's, to my kids in my lifetime. And so we're looking at, at, at doing that training in January. We've already uh, met up with Sedona PD. We've gone through some lockdown drills with them at the high schools. Uh, we've got an invite from Cottonwood Fire, who on November 10th, I believe, is doing an active shooter drill with the hospital. Uh, we've been invited to come down. Um, and we're really working together regionally, especially when it comes to the policy, on, on making sure everybody's on the same page for this. Hopefully, we never have to use it. I hope we never have to use it. Where are you going to keep the... We're equipment, the battalion we're chief? Or? Well, right now we've got, uh, the, the purchase order was for 10 sets of gear. That would be two per engine if need be, or four uh, per engine and then two on the battalion chief's vehicle. And that's to be decided you know, through the ops chief and the fire chief when we sit down with the committee and decide what's going to be the best utilization for that equipment. Uh, but right now the 10 sets would cover the five first out engines. Um, and we're looking at purchasing or figuring out some, some padded bagging, much like SWAT officers use to haul their gear around so the gear's protected. There are ceramic plates, um, so they, they can break, but the plates that we're looking at are a poly monolithic plate, which has a 10-year life expectancy versus a five-year life expectancy, so it, it helps with that reduction in every five years having to replace expired plates. And they're a little lighter weight, they're like 7.1 pounds versus some of the other ones that are over eight pounds. So on that note, a couple things. So one, we want to get these 10 in, in play, get them going, get comfortable using them, see where the, the opportunities are. Part of us would also like to get a little bit of time. So if we do replacements 10 years from now, we're replacing you know, in, in, a, in a good cycle as well versus you know, we buy, let's say we need 20. If we decide at the end of the day we need 20 of them, if that's what we decide, we'll, we'll get them spaced in you know, to, to where we need to be. And I didn't mention, but this not only is the is the, pa the, the vest, but it's also a, a, a triage kit and a, and a stop the bleed. And it's a got a, a this, this specific design has an extra tourniquet holder, and then it's got what they call a, an IFAC kit. It's an individual uh, first responder um, aid kit. So we've got extra tourniquets, um, gauze, quick clot that is all included in this purchase order that we don't have to purchase separate with some of the other kits. And then, you know, through our uh, EMS chief, trying to fill that and, and purchase that equipment on a separate note. This comes fully equipped with this gear. And, you know, we, we took careful consideration talking to Phoenix. I, I actually talked to the division chief of EMS down at Phoenix Fire at the class we were on. And uh, they were very impressed by us really trying to spearhead this and get ahead of the curve. Um, they're, they're still trying to get up to speed, believe it or not, as large an organization as that is. And, and they see the need for it. Um, so they were really impressed by the steps we're taking, trying to coordinate that training up here, the training we've already done with local law enforcement uh, agencies and neighboring um, fire departments. So again, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but as the chief mentioned, we want to make sure we're well equipped and prepared should this ever occur, and hopefully it doesn't. And, and lastly, the, the other piece, we're talking about active shooter hostile environments called ASHER, um, active shooter hostile environment response. Um, talking with uh, Battalion Chief Baker and I and, and a couple others, you know, there's a strong possibility that we may end up wearing these in other events that are maybe not, you know, but we go to some unstable events with folks just to prepare. And sadly enough, there's enough firefighters getting attacked or ambushed and things like that. So if we're responding to, an, you know, a situation with a gun or a, you know, a, a domestic call with, you know, some whatever, that we, we, you may see us in these. If we're going to do it, we're going to put them on 
more than one time never in our career type of thing because we want to protect our folks. So we've, we're working on a lot of little discussions about how and where, where that should look. And <coughs> I think as a citizen, it, you see some folks coming in and sit on a fire with ballistic vests on, you might think, well, is that really necessary? I, it's, it's a little too late to ask, was it really was yeah. it really necessary? They should have had it on. And so that's where, where we're at. And uh, we even had lots of discussion about, do we even ever even go into a warm zone? Why would we ever do that? Maybe we don't even need any gear. Let the cops sort it out and we'll get in. We've had just, We've had a really healthy discussion about where we should or shouldn't be and why we should and shouldn't be. And uh, uh, like I said, this isn't a discussion I thought I would ever have in my career, but I'm wholeheartedly uh, behind it and support it and think it's, it's necessary. And while we're ahead of the curve, we're certainly you know, right at the curl of the wave or whatever. You're, I mean, we're, we're not the first ones that are doing this. this we're, so we're, we're catching up in some ways also. You know, Chief, I had probably just more of a point than, uh, than a question, but through your working with your staff in, a, in a drafting up a policy, do you see the, the assault with the deadly weapons, the stabbings, the domestic disputes being part of the policy in which a vest like this would be worn? I, I, I do. Um, those are probably, well, I'm not sure they'll be the same policy or different. I mean, their active shooter has a certain criteria that's com completely different than mm -hmm. you're in a you know, in, in, a, in a hostile environment of a, of, of a different nature. Um, so where that looks like, I think we'll still work on that as staff, but I, I think uh, um, we'll, we'll probably evolve to that somehow, some way. What that looks like, I don't know today. Like I said, we want to get the vests, get them here, get some people comfortable, understand that this is what they're for, why they're here, and then do we need 10 more, do we need, you know, three more, whatever it may be. Um, and so we want to just get this purchase order going. We've got a training coming up, as Jordan mentioned. We want to be in them and and get them here, so that's why we're here today to talk about this and uh, and, and make it happen. So, if uh, short of the policy parts of this stuff, which you know again isn't necessarily you know is deeper than we need to be here today, but happy to talk about it if, yeah. if we do. We're just not ready. It will be regional. There is support for that, and uh, and we will be prepared if, if something happens in the future. And I think there was there was one other question about the the, the sleeves for right. the ceramic plates. These do, yes, sir. They have the sleeves, so. After that that ten year expiration for the ceramic plates, or you know, forbid they take a a, a hit and they crack, um, those plates are are removed from the sleeve, and you can put the new uh, polymonolithic plates in there. Chief, uh, one last question I have is is that this was not a budgeted item back in the budget correct time, and so where might this uh, line item? So uh, as, as you may remember through the budgeting process, uh, we took out all the contingency funding of the budget uh, in the fire chief's budget. There is a fire chief special project, $25,000 allotment for things that kind of come up like this. And while we've been pondering this, we weren't ready at the budget time to just plug any number in. And so our plan at that time was we'll just take some of this money out of that, that project uh, as, as need be. And uh, so that is where the, the funds will come from. Okay. Any further questions? I'll make a motion. I move to approve PO 1770 to Officer Survivor Solutions for $10,460 for the purchase of ballistic protection equipment. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes to purchase. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item. Next item on the agenda is a, a board member item discussion. Discussion possible action for the exploration of policy regarding courtesy quorum announcements for the board. So I believe this is uh, board member Cooperman who, uh, Clark Cooperman who asked us to be on this, the agenda, so I will. Yes, yes, I ask this because um, I, I think it would be uh, good to add to our board policy manual um, the requirement <laughs> that uh, a, a, a complimentary or um, courtesy, courtesy, a courtesy quorum notice uh, be issued uh, whenever we expect uh, or have the possibility of the three uh, board members meeting somewhere at the same time. And I don't mean the word meeting, but perhaps attending uh, an event like, like the open house that happened this weekend, uh, like awards. Uh, uh, event that, that gets put on 
uh, occasional civic events when we have a sense that there might be three and have it be part of board policy. Right now it's not. So if I could have the attorney maybe chime in at all on just what the mm -hmm. legal ram or legal requests are on this or requirements. Uh, with regard to this kind of thing, I've dealt with it in, uh, in different boards. Uh, some boards, uh, if they're aware of, of meetings or parties going on, they will notice that there's going to be uh, uh, board members at this. And so they know that they can go and not be violating board policy. Those meetings, there's never a discussion with regard to items that you want to take action mm -hmm. on, but it does protect the board as far as um, uh, attending those meetings and not being in violation of the open meeting law. So there are, um, with Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, they, they used to do that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the uh, school boards that I dealt with done that also, and even with Sedona uh, in past years, uh, when I was over in Sedona, they had the notices to go to functions that, uh, that they would, uh, uh, that, that, that there was a function and there were board members, so it's not unusual to have that kind of thing, and, and probably for, for board protection, wise to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so board, so it, it's a courtesy notice. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's no law or mandate that mm -hmm. says you have to or shall do it. Clark Cooperman's, uh, I believe after our conversation, just said, I think it should be a board policy that we just do it by policy because we're, you know, hit or miss. Sometimes, like, do they want, do, should we do this? Might there be somebody? <laughs> I don't know. And that, you know, so, so for staff, it's just easier. If you want us to do it every time, we will do it every time. That's not a problem. We're happy to do it. Mm -hmm. There's no... There's no, uh, you know, not putting staff out to do anything major. We just, it's, we've been hit or miss uh, only by whatever, you know, is coming up or not coming up. And, and if uh, Carrie mm -hmm. needs to know that, it, you know, it's open house, there could be more than three, she'll put a courtesy notice out. There's, you know, the ward's dinner and, you know, mm -hmm. there could be more than three of you folks there. We'll put it out. And it's well, I th but it's just going to be for, for, for SFD events. I mean, you can't put out a courtesy notice for everything that goes on. This no, someone's got a birthday party at their house. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to no. make that happen. It'll be, I mean, it, unless you guys know you're going somewhere and one of you notice us and say, Hey, by the way, we're all going to the well, like to the uh, mayor's or ball the, or something. Or the AFTA conference. The AFTA conference. Uh -huh. I mean, typically fire district things yeah. related, but like exactly. I said, if you're having a barbecue at your back house, you know, in your pizza oven there, Dave, I, I mean, I, I'm not I'd sure like that courtesy. that's, you know, to the level, and I'm sure the attorney's got anything to weigh in on. I mean, that's... that's We're just talking about public functions Basically. related right. to yes. being a fire board member. Yeah. And I think that way um, we fire board members don't have to wonder, oh, who's going or should you go or not go, that we have the courtesy notice out and it really protects all of us. So that's what I uh, would hope that uh, put before you for... Uh, well, then would this be more of a, a, a motion in need or would this be more of a just a consensus of the board mm -hmm. to get this done? I think uh, probably we can, uh, our office can put together a, a policy that, uh, that the board can then adopt uh, to, to take action. I, I, I think a board, I think board action is probably wise. Um, so well, we have nothing, all you're going to be moving on is that we're going to create a policy there's nothing to nothing to approve right now right okay right. so then then I would direct staff to uh, to create the, the policy of a courtesy uh, notification you got it. Uh, via the agenda or how are we going to do it yep. we'll we'll do it on November meeting with some language and uh, <laughs> we'll make that happen if that's the direction you like and there's I think consensus yeah. on that we'll put it yeah, on that's the good. okay well we have a consensus then for that very thing um, and I don't at that's at this point I think that's all we need to get that's, I think that's all we need to do. As long as it's consensus, that's what you want to do. Make it a policy, then we will do it. Okay. Well, let's, yes. let's do that. So we will, do you have the direction uh, from the board to yep. create that as policy, uh, as a courtesy for announcing? You got it. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. <coughs> uh, next item on the agenda is the fire marshal safety message. Well, uh, even though Ed and I probably aren't the most pretty people in the room, take a look at our faces. The chief talked about it earlier. <laughs> These little spots that we've got on our faces. Um, we participated in the, the skin cancer screening that was held at the station yesterday. 
what you see on our faces was the remnants of what is called actinic keratinosis, um, excuse me, keratosis. More than 58 million Americans are affected by this. It's the most common precancer for, for skin cancers. Um, every year, uh, more people are diagnosed with skin cancer than all other cancers combined in America. Uh, one person dies from melanoma every hour in America. 86% uh, of melanomas and 90% of non-melanomas are directly attributable to UV sun exposure. I've had more than five sunburns in my life. Uh, if you have more than five sunburns in your life, your uh, odds of developing melanoma doubles. And the majority of people diagnosed with melanoma in the U.S. are white males over the age of 55. Mm -hmm. So uh, melanoma kills people every year, every day. Uh, it's not a joke. Get screened. Wear your sunscreen. Thank yeah, you. Wear your sunscreen. And sunscreen. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Next on the agenda is executive session, and the board's taken the liberty to move the executive session to the end of the meeting due to the anticipated length of the executive session. Uh, obviously, the public is welcome to, to wait until we return, uh, but then again, uh, I have no idea how long that's going to take. So with that said, uh, possible vote to go into executive session pursuant to ARS 38431.03A5 regarding discussions or consultations with the designated representatives of the public body in order to consider its position and instruct its representatives regarding negotiations with employee organizations regarding the district memorandum of understanding legal advice pursuant to ARS 38431.03.83 regarding the same and for instruction to legal counsel pursuant to ARS 38431.03. A4 regarding the terms of the memorandum of understanding. Uh, in addition to that, a uh, possible vote to go into executive session on personal matters pursuant to ARS 38431.03A1 in regards to the Chief's employment and effective and effect that the Chief's potential candidacy for another position might have on his employment. Legal advice pursuant to ARS 38-43A3 in regards to the same. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, Ask for uh, create a motion to go into executive session. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. We are in executive session. <clears throat> yeah, Carrie, just let me know when you're ready. Okay, we'll reconvene in public session. <clears throat> As a result of executive session, uh, under the first item, uh, A5, as related to the memorandum of understanding, uh, the board directs the fire chief to pursue the MOU amendment uh, as presented and to be effective July 1, 2019. Is that a, a motion that they should take? Okay, with, with that, uh, uh, that being the motion made, uh, do I have a second? Second. second. Do I have any further discussion? None? I, I do. I'd like to just say that I, I just want to thank you, Chief, and uh, the, the committee that you've been working with because you put a lot of work into uh, re uh, constructing a very good um, professional development program. Thank you. So a second has been made. Uh, additional discussion has been concluded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll move forward with that, that amendment to the MOU. Thank you. Under the second item, uh, as far as the chief's uh, employment status, uh, under A1, the fire chief has made us aware uh, of his current employment options and uh, his desire to maintain transparency. Uh, he is 
uh, in full, he is fully committed to, to maintaining uh, his desire uh, in providing the services that he has of our fire district and of the community, uh, irregardless of whatever the outcome is. So with that said, uh, I don't believe there is a motion to be made, uh, just simply the statement by the board. Is that correct? correct. Okay. So with that said, uh, without any further ado, I will. Well, I, I'd like to just say that I, I want to thank you, Chief, that I think you've gone above and beyond uh, what is typical of transparency in alerting us to the potential that you uh, might be leaving. That is a might. And uh, that um, I have a lot of confidence that you will function <laughs> full tilt as you have all along as our fire chief. Thank you. I appreciate that honor, and I will certainly live up to the expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending where where things take me, uh, I will keep you posted. Okay. With that said, this meeting is adjourned.